Hey everybody, Mike Giardina here uh, with CrossFit Health at the Symposium for Metabolic Health and we're here with Dr. Uh, Robert Sivas and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, self-speak um, and, and, and how, how self-speak well, influences the right word, but you know how, how this plays out whether you're trying to start, let's say, start a new diet, start doing CrossFit or any other fitness program. And then what happens when you've, you've started this new behavior and you fall off, right? You, you go out with some friends and you, you have a bad meal or you miss your workouts. How do you get back on track, okay? So I'd love to start off with um, what influences self-speak, how you talk to yourself when you're trying to start something new. And let's, let's start off with, because we were talking about this a little bit before our interview, um, initiating something like CrossFit, right? Let's say I'm, I'm in, for lack of a better way to describe it, poor health, and I've, I've seen CrossFit, I've seen people do it, I've seen that there's some, some pretty drastic improvements that, that uh, could be achieved if I can get myself into that gym, but how do I get myself into that gym? Especially if I don't have an athletic background. I don't come from a family that has you know, fitness and sport as part of their DNA. Right. So, you know, Mike, um, what I've looked at a lot with my patients, with the folks that I work with, is every human being is defined by the conversation you have with yourself. Okay. And the conversation is heavily based on what I call your locus of validation. And locus of validation, if you do things that you are proud of, mm. that locus of validation is internal because it's about self-affirmation. When I do something and I say, I don't want to tap my mic, but yes. give myself that backpack and say, wow, I'm proud of you. Nobody else's opinion matters. Right. What matters is I put effort into something and I'm proud of the effort. Now, the two ways that that can be contaminated. First and foremost, some people are raised where, ah, you know what, they have an idea, yeah, I should go to CrossFit, but you know, I'm a blob, I, I, I need to go. And then they find 10 reasons why it's a bad idea. Mm. And so they have a problem, they're very permissive, they don't have boundaries, they don't have structure to their lives, nobody's fault, but it's just the way they were raised, and they're unable to sustainably execute. Or they go once and they, yeah, I'm into this, and the next day they wake up, they're a little sore and stiff, like everybody is the first, and yeah. pfft, they find a reason. It's never that I'm sore and stiff and I'm afraid to go. Because right. that's not part of your self-speak. It's like, you know what, I, I really should go, but I hurt my ankle. I can't. There's right. always something. Sure. The second group of people are raised in what I call an authoritarian way, mm. where their locus, of, their, their locus of validation is not internal because it's all about the outcome, not the effort. You yes. see, the return of investment is on the effort. You can go to the gym and feel awful, just didn't feel like going, you, you feel horrible, you maybe have a bit of a cold coming on, you've even got a hangover, but you get your butt in the door and you work out for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. That should be more self-affirming to you because you, you made it happen. Mm -hmm. But if you walk into the gym and say, I have to be here for an hour, I have to lift this amount of weights, I have to do this, you're always gonna fall short. Yeah. And when you are outcome-based, then you're always falling short of what you actually did because you created ridiculous outcome metrics for yourself. Yeah. Then you can't self-affirm because it's no longer about the effort you put in. It's about the result you didn't achieve. And that gap is filled with an incredibly erosive sense of self. Yeah. Your self-esteem, your self-confidence, your self-respect is eroded because I'm never good enough. And we yeah. get raised in those families. Absolutely. So, and, and those folks will go in and be ashamed to be in there because they're always looking at somebody else. I mean, I, did a, I come from an authoritarian family background. I looked at you and I said, oh my God, I've got to talk to this guy? Look at him. <laughs> he looks ridiculously good. And here I am, a blob. No. And, and it's still, as, as much as I have that language with myself, my confidence has grown tremendously, it's still part of who I am because I come from a highly authoritarian well, family. Well, as you explain this, it's something that hits home pretty hard with me as well and it's um, I, you know, I've been doing CrossFit since 2005 and I had competed in uh, a pretty a reasonably high level earlier on in, in CrossFit competitions but went to the game six times and but I was in this position with training for such a long time with CrossFit where I didn't enjoy training right it, it, 
the pressure was always on to get well, better. Let me stop you for a second, Mike. You threw myself. something out in the first, and, and we reveal where our head is. Yeah. You threw something out that I'm very attuned to with my patients. Okay. Within the second sentence, mm. you said, I competed. You had to let me know that you competed. Yeah. That is an external form of validation because totally. you're competing That's for somebody else's praise. 100%. And because the competition required something of you that didn't just make you feel wonderful. Yeah. Now that you're not necessarily competing, yeah. you got your game back. Because yeah, yeah. now it's, you know, self-speak is about me and me. Yeah. It's never about anybody else. But when you're competing, when you're, whether it's a competition or whether you're fighting somebody else, you're trying to meet somebody else's standards, it becomes very, very challenging. Yeah. And, and you don't enjoy it as much. Because the, when you have a bad day, it's I'm terrible. When you have a good day, I wasn't good enough. Right. So because there is no end point. But when you say, man, I felt great today. Now, in little increments, you've built up self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-respect. So even you can have that insight to say, wow, you know what? Look at my self-speak. Mm -hmm. And right now, it's about the conversation I have with myself that, yeah, I had a good workout. Yeah. It and creeps in every It creeps in. Though. Of course. Of course it does. You know, Just like it did with me. Yeah. G generally, generally, it is about the experience, and I feel good. I mean, I just feel great doing what I'm doing. But there are those times where, yeah, I, I can feel that... that I'm not good enough, or ah, you know, the workout didn't go as planned, and it's it's like I got to do it again, or you know, uh, I, I'm 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 going, I'm not progressing anymore, I'm regressing, you know, all those different things. So uh, it's really interesting how it tends to pop up, but generally, uh, for the most part, the the enjoyment is back in training for the sake of, and, and that's what it's all about. Yeah. It's it isn't about what you show other people. Yeah. It's about, because ultimately fitness, athleticism, I call it physical activity because it encompasses a whole genre. Right. Some people just go for a walk. Some people pound it out in the gym. Cool. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Physical activity is a primal endorphin activator. Yeah. It is one of the four or five core things that we do in an effort-based way to have a strong core, a strong sense of self. Yeah. But the problem is that a lot of people are raised in a way where they, for authoritarian or permissive reasons, don't have the capacity to benefit. They either don't put the effort in or the effort is meaningless. And then they outsource their sense of self so that they look for an external source of validation. Right. Either you're doing things for other people. So all these people that have to compete, that have to be brilliant, perhaps they're not doing it for themselves. Yeah. They're looking for the, uh, for the uh, affirmation from other people. And the affirmation, affirmation from others can never be conditional, uh, unconditional at least. Now, in, in what I do for a living, which is carbohydrate addiction, where people are using, yeah. they've migrated away from eating primarily for nutrition and they're eating more and more um, using sugar and starch and snacking as a drug, sure. as an external thing to get themselves high. Yeah. That is the, addiction is the ultimate source of external validation. I can't make myself feel good, so I need to eat a Twinkie to make me feel good. And it's, we're looking for that instant high, but it's never good enough because on the back, there's negativity, there's guilt, there's remorse, oh, there's exactly. harm. Well, it's just like drugs. Just like drugs. So, you know, you can turn something like an effort-based athletic performance mm. into the best drug that you can get high on with no negative. Yeah, yeah. I don't care if I go for a five-minute walk or I work out in the gym for an hour. Yeah. I'm feeling pumped because I'm proud of myself. Right. Whereas if you said I have to, yeah. you're in all kinds of trouble. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? Every now and then we go in with an idea of what we want to do and we fall short. Yeah. Or you wake up one morning and you're feeling a bit down and depressed and you pig out on a bunch of waffles and pancakes and you miss the workout and you feel terrible, you have to drink a few more too many beers. How do you recover from that? Yeah. And that's self-speak. Interesting. Because you beat the crap out of yourself. No, you don't. Look, I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Mistakes happen. If you can objectify your mistake and say, look, it happened. I'm not a terrible person because I did that. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't recognize I was down or depressed or frustrated. I self-medicated in a way that's not conducive to me, here's how I get back on track. And you consciously force yourself to do something you love to do that requires effort. It might be some meditation, it might be a conversation with someone, mm -hmm. it might just be putting on some music, it might be going for a walk or going to the gym. And it should be done alone. Interesting. It should be done alone so that you can then restore self-affirmation. It's fine to go to the CrossFit gym and be with all your buddies, but when you're recovering from going sideways, I don't call it a, 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 maybe a relapse, but really going sideways, mm -hmm. where you needed emotional restitution, but you found it in the wrong place. Getting back on track requires a little bit of alone time, mm. 
just to mend the fences and restore positive self-speak. Because we go down the rabbit hole, I'm a terrible person, I'm horrible, why did I do that? I'm yeah. useless, I'm pathetic. Yeah. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to need more drugs and more bad behavior to make you feel better. Okay, so, so a couple things I'm noticing here. So one, one of the, the a, a, a good approach is some level of acceptance, accept that this was a mistake and mistakes happen. Objectify. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't subjectify it because then you attach right. I'm a terrible person to it. Right, right. And then uh, spend some time alone kind of resolving it. I've got a little phrase that I use. I actually stole it from someone. None of my phrases are my own. I hear them and I incorporate them. But I can tell you, and you have probably can say the same thing. I have spent my hardest moments alone when other people thought I was just doing fine. Yeah. And it's... That alone time where you need to go, not to dive into a pit of depression, no. but to really have that conversation with yourself sort stuff out. and yeah. sort stuff out, sort through stuff. There are some people who can chat to other people and, and use human connection as a way to restore faith. But the problem is when we've had that, when we've gone sideways a little bit, we don't feel so good about ourselves. And it becomes very, very difficult to trust somebody else implicitly or to be vulnerable with them. Mm. There are people that do, yeah. because, but the greatest strength a human being can have is vulnerable human connection. Right. When you can talk about things you're a little ashamed of. Yeah. Some people can, my wife is just fantastic at that. Yeah. I'm not, yeah, I yeah, need yeah. that alone time, but I need to do something that I can affirm about. And, and that's self-speak, that's part of the conversation we have with ourselves. The only people that are perfect are the gum flappers on the internet. <laughs> that was the other, you know, they, yeah, you see them every day and they're yes, out there doing their thing. And, yeah, 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 for sure. I'm for not sure. that. I am not that. So let's, so let's talk a little bit about what you, or not what, who you tend to work with most. And that is adolescents or, or from what age group? What is the age group that you... We will work... I, I mean, I, my own son started this path before he was a zygote, before he was two cells. Yeah. So we start... when you, The best time to start when you're planning pregnancy. Yeah. And it's not just the eating and the drinking. It's not just the fitness. It's how are we going to raise this child with a valuable sense of self. Mm -hmm. A sense of self where they're not arrogant, not narcissistic. They're quietly humble. That, that, uh, I think it's Tim McGraw song. That humble and kind song is mm -hmm. like an anthem for me. Perfect. Because it's about being proud of who you are, but you're humble on the outside. Right. People who should like to show off to others because they need their affirmation. Right. Complete polar opposite. So we work with young children. It's much, much easier to start somebody out from birth along these pathways and help the parents. It's more difficult to turn people around, but that's the majority of what we end up doing. So throughout life, whether it's obesity, whether it's people that are athletes trying to get better, mm. whether it is people that are athletes that are finding, okay, I'm 35, 40, my body isn't performing like it used to perform. Mm -hmm. I could eat a certain way, now I'm not doing it. And what do athletes do when they start getting a little bit, a little bit of a belly and, and they start lagging behind? They go to the gym, they run harder, they yeah, run yeah. more, they put on more miles on their bodies yeah, yeah. and things get worse. Yeah. So we've got to look at the eating and the drinking down. side and yeah. say, okay, what's happening internally? You see, the thing about it is that food is toxic or not so much food, but things that we eat and drink that aren't good for us are toxic, are toxic at entry into the body. Yeah. They aren't toxic necessarily through weight. You can eat a pile of crap, and yeah. in my case, it's carbohydrates, and go to the gym and burn it off. Sure. But the damage was already done. Nobody smokes three cigarettes and goes to the gym to blow out the nicotine. Okay, that's ludicrous. Okay? Right, that's a but, great... But, but fat people love to pig away and then... Well, they get on the treadmill and they burn a thousand calories. Well, then ice cream is only 90 calories and they justify eating the ice cream. Easy. It's easy to do. We do that all the all time. All the time. Yeah, and absolutely. we try to burn off what, the mistakes we made. No, you can't go... You cannot fix history. And it's some of the messaging... Uh, somewhat promotes that that you know the the only thing that matters is calories in versus calories out Look, I can it doesn't matter what I'm eating this is the the caloric quantity of it here's what I'm doing on the treadmill here are the calories that I'm burning wipes it out doesn't matter so I'll tell you something interesting it's impossible to get fat from eating food and the reason for that now it's not true ever yeah. well 
there's two very important things that you need to understand. The first thing is this, the human body is brilliant in the way it's constructed. Yeah. Yours a little bit more than mine, but <laughs> be that as it may, <laughs> I gotta throw that one out there. A little envy there. Um, but the point is that we have checks and balances when we're doing things that the human body requires. Mm. I'll give you an example, one of the coolest things that the human body does, and a guy by the name of Tim Noakes, who's been a mentor for me for years, said this, what regulates fatigue? Okay, so this is interesting because you said Tim Noakes, and so I, I went through a, a exercise physiology program through a bachelor's and a master's, mm -hmm. and I loved the idea. I loved Dr. Noakes' uh, one central governor theory, and then two, the way that he challenged a very established theory of VO2 max. Mike, he VO2. challenged himself. I knew Tim when I was. 21, 22 years old. Yeah. I was in his first ever physiology class as a young medical wow. student, okay? So yeah. he and I go way back. Yeah. And Tim, he's nuts. He used to go on these ultra marathons with a needle in his hand. Yeah. And while he was running, he was jabbing his thigh, uh. taking muscle biopsies ah. to look at glycogen. Because the prevailing theory, and, what, and Tim says this, what made him famous as an exercise physiologist, many things, but one of the dominant things was the muscle fatigue. Mm -hmm. That when your muscles ran out of energy, glycogen, glucose, sure. you bumped. Yeah. But, and, and he's now over 70 years old. He's just had this epiphany from a group of, Swiss, uh, of Swedish uh, uh, um, sports writers yeah. or, or, or sports uh, um, scientists who realized that that's not humanly possible. It's not possible to run out of energy in your muscles because you're going to Rigor. Your muscles would seize up. Yeah. So the beauty about what happens with us is the human brain starts to sense that its energy supply is being threatened. Sure. And the brain has to have a continuous supply of sugar and ketones. Right. Okay? And as soon as it notices a slight dip, uh, you're a guy, and I'm, I'm being sexist here, but us guys do this. You're driving down the road, and, the, and the, um, here in California where it's nice and hot, and the, um, uh, your, your gauge gets to empty. Yeah. First thing you do, because you're going to try to go as far as you can, you turn off the air conditioner, you open up the windows, <laughs> you drive, so you try to spare that energy. Well, the brain yeah. does the same thing. Yeah, yeah, and, for sure. and the biggest spend is your muscles if you're working out, so the brain starts to slow you down. Right. That's exactly the central governor theory yeah, of Tim Noakes. Yeah, yeah. And he actually, I, I, I'll say this, he did it on a podcast with me the very first time he spoke about it. We discussed it in India, and it makes so much sense that the brain sense. slows you down. Yeah. And no matter what you're doing, You've got to look at, okay, where's my performance and what slows me down? Mm -hmm. And in life, that's generally your head. Mm -hmm. Self-speak or energy regulation, mm -hmm. the, the human brain will slow you down. It is the central governor of everything we do. Interesting. Well, that is amazing. That is so, uh, you know, so, I, I mean, that's just, it's, when, so when you're an athlete, I said earlier on that it's impossible to get fat from eating food. Mm -hmm. Well, the human body has very, very tight regulation in terms mm -hmm. of what you eat. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. You sit down, how much, you like, you eat steak. I assume you're not, I do. you don't like, you don't hate red meat. I do not hate okay. red meat. No. So let's say you sit down and there's an 80 ounce steak in front of you. The cow yeah. just sat down. How much can you eat? Oh, That's the right answer. Yeah. You have no idea. No idea. And no the problem. reason you have no idea is because it doesn't matter. You start to eat might be 10 ounces, 20 ounces, 30, it doesn't matter. Oh my God, I'm stuffed. Yeah. A signal is going from your belly to your brain that says, Mike, you're done. you're done. Two minutes later, you're not sitting in front of the TV with a bowl of steak, right. but you are sitting there with a bowl of M&Ms, a bowl of ice cream, yeah, a bowl of eat. pretzels. Sure. In other words, you're not eating nutrition. Your body has said, Mike, you're full, you're done. It stopped you. Mm -hmm. Fat and protein, the hard stopping point. But carbohydrates, sugar and starch, no stopping point. Mm. The more you eat, the more you consume, the more buzz you get, the more you eat. You have to self-limit because there is no internal limit. I'll give you another example. You're drinking water. How much water should you drink in a day? Nobody needs to know. Why? Because your body tells you how much. Right. You might drink a lot, you might drink a little. But you can be, your thirst can be quenched. Someone gives you a beer, you can still drink the beer. Yeah. You're not drinking more water because there is no regulation for endorphin activating substances that give us a buzz that huh. the human body doesn't need. Human body needs protein and fat. Human body needs water, doesn't need alcohol, doesn't need carbohydrates. Interesting. So it's a positive feedback cycle. Right. And that's why food doesn't make us fat, but sugar and starch does, and it gives us that buzz. So the more we eat, the, the more we do. And you're either gonna become diabetic or obese or both based on how your body works. So that's the addiction part. So why do we do it? We do it as a dysfunctional way of emotional management. You go to the gym every, what would happen if you broke both your arms and both your legs? 
I would assume that uh, not being able to train as much as I do, um, I would be pretty down on myself. You'd be pr you'd be a puddle of water. You'd Ab you'd be because your world, your 100. emotion management world, revolves around your gym routine. Absolutely. Well, there's plenty of obese people and diabetics whose entire world revolves around snacking and carbohydrates. Yeah. And if you're going to say, oh, I'm going to do a keto diet today, the day you take away those carbohydrates, it's the same as you breaking oh, both your legs yeah, yeah. and both your arms. Yeah. Because their entire emotion management system has been taken away. Mm. So what you do is you replace it, you diversify. So let's say you didn't have arms and legs. Well, maybe you can listen to music. Maybe you can read a book. Maybe you can do some meditation. There are other avenues. Human connection, physical activity, creative arts, spirituality, meditation are the four cornerstones of an internalized sense of self. So okay. when you're working with, with somebody who uh, is using carbohydrates as a way to emotionally regulate, as you're starting to strip those foods away, you're replacing them with another way to regulate their emotions. Abs because if you remove their drug of choice, yeah. what are you going to replace it with? Because life can be good. It's easy to not eat carbohydrates on an easy day. But when life throws you that emotional curveball, where are you going to go? Which happens. That's, okay? that's life. It's if you miss a, a workout on a day where you're having a lot of fun, you know what, not good. But at the same time, the world didn't end. But if you're having an awful day where things are just going bad and you can't get to a gym or a workout, you're in all kinds of trouble. Yeah. No different. Yeah. But you don't have to be an athlete. You know, yeah. Taylor Swift is not an athlete, but from a young child, writing music and playing music was her gym. Yeah. So there are thespians, there are musicians, there are people that work out in the gym, but those are all internal forms of validation. Those yeah. are all things we do, and there's never ever a bad thing. You go to the gym and you work out, and you pull a muscle, or you drop a weight on your foot and you break your toe. You were just a klutz. It's not that the gym was bad, right. but you eat a tub of ice cream every day and now you've got diabetes. Yeah. That's a problem. That's a problem. So, uh, Doing what we do, an effort-based emotion management system, is negative, never negative. That's why it's so uplifting. That's why that self-speak is so big. And if we can take young kids and teach them a set of effort-based emotion management systems, and you cannot outsource this. Nobody can go to the gym for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, shake weights don't work. Right. You know, right. Or, or those, those, those tubes, you know, those, that, that, that you can't outsource, little, right, you can't outsource what we do for self-affirmation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you do, it's, you're looking for external validation. Right. So you can take that child and teach them to learn to love themselves based on what they do. Then what other people say about them is in addition to that, it is not a dependency. And you, you label that as effort. Effort-based effort based emotion regular. management system. Okay, and so what, what else falls within that realm outside of fitness or exercise? Physical, physical activity. And I use physical activity to describe the entire Walks. bunch. Now, it doesn't matter. physical activity, mobility, is the most important aspect of healthy longevity. Yeah. But it includes strength and endurance when you're young, yeah. but then later on, flexibility mm -hmm. and balance. Yeah. You talk to a 75-year-old person, yeah. It's more about flexibility and balance that yeah. keeps them alive than anything else. But those four things are mobility or physical activity. Sure. The second one is creative arts. And it could be reading, writing, music, fashion, okay. photography. Exactly. It doesn't matter. Something creative where you disappear becomes a fortress of solitude. Mm -hmm. You know when you're in the gym, the world can dissolve around you. You're working out because yeah. that's your zone. There's this ultimate right? sense of presence, if you wanted to call it. Exactly that. right. When Taylor Swift is writing or playing music, the audience is nice. Yeah. But she's doing it for herself. Yeah. And, and uh, if you have, if you're religious, a spiritual moment, yeah. might be church, might be the Bible, but it's really about a communication with a higher power, right. that mo or a moment of meditation. Yeah. Or when you're engaged with someone in an empathetic human connection, and those are the toughest ones, yeah. because you have to trust the person implicitly. That vulnerab vulnerability. Right. Piece. If you don't trust someone, you're not going to be vulnerable about things you're a little ashamed of. Mm. But when you've had a good conversation with someone you trust, someone you care about, and you've been open, mm -hmm. that bond is so strong. Yeah. And those are the four elements. And then a healthy sexual relationship with someone that you care about. Yeah. Those five things are the healthiest, most powerful sources of emotion management that any human being can have. And when you've internalized that, you don't need anybody else's affirmation. Yeah. And that's the self-speak we need. Gosh, I love this. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if you're gonna raise that child, yeah. teach them the value of effort. 
Yes, you put effort in up front. You've got to assign time and hardship up front. But that reward is limitless on the back end. And it's about building self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-respect. And that reward is for you, it's not for anyone Of course, else. Yeah. of course. Yeah. Other people's approval is nice, but you can then afford to be completely humble about everything yeah. because your pride is inside. Yeah. As my friend Tim McGraw's yeah. song goes, yeah. I don't know Tim McGraw at all, but, <laughs> but I, I, I wish I did. But, but the point is that when we externalize that, yeah. that's when we're looking for other people, and then sure. we shine our coat. So we, we put on airs and graces that don't necessarily belong to us. Right. We try to be better than we are, internet perfect. Yeah. And at that, at that point, it's never enough, right? There's always someone else to try to impress. And someone's always going to say, yeah, that's good, but what about this? Right, right. Or you can say it to yourself, oh, that's great, but he's better. Exactly right. It's never about outcomes. It's yeah. about effort. Yeah. And the beauty is, uh, let me ask you another question along these lines. Do you know who the Dalai Lama is or the Dalai Lama? He's a spiritual leader in the Tibet. Dalai Lama? Yeah, Dalai Lama, yeah. yeah. Um, would you say that he's an expert at meditation? I would assume, but I okay. don't know. Well, you've been doing CrossFit since before you were born. Yeah. Okay. Would you say you're an expert at CrossFit? Yes. Okay. You're absolutely not. And neither is, <laughs> neither is the Dalai Lama. And here's why. And he will tell you this. He's not an expert. He may be the best in the world at it. Yeah. But he's a student. Because if you're an expert, I'm done. Then you just stop I'm done. Learning. I'm yeah, done. I've got it. I know it all. Yeah. If I'm a student, no matter how good I am, Every day there's more to be done. And I know what gets you up in the morning mm -hmm. is being able to go to the gym and not repeat what you did yesterday, but do something new. Yeah, improve, do that something keep, that, new. There's yeah. something more I have to do. And yeah. as long as there's always more, this is a journey. There is no end point. There are milestones, yeah. but there's never ever an end point or a goal. Yeah. It ends 10 minutes after we're dead. And as long as you're chasing that, you're never going to be knocked sideways. Yeah. Or you may stray a little bit, but you're not you going backwards. Back Absolutely. And that's what we help our patients to do. Because it's not about how well you do on one day. Yeah. It's about how well you sustain the pathway. And you're doing it for you. That's the big part. I love it.